Hey, LinkedIn, and welcome back to Business Unusual. This is a live show where we are speaking as a community about how the coronavirus is impacting the ways that we all work. I'm Caroline Fairchild, editor-at-large here at LinkedIn, coming to you from my home office here in New York City. For the past couple of weeks, states have been releasing racial data to show how the coronavirus is spreading, and Black Americans are at a higher risk of contracting the disease as well as dying from it. But those numbers don't tell us the full story of how the Black community will be impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. New research out by McKinsey shows that 39% of jobs held by Black Americans are at risk of wage deductions as well as layoffs. On today's show, we'll be speaking with McKinsey researchers Shelly Stewart as well as Jason Wright to break down what the report is telling us, but also talk about community-based solutions for this issue. I want to talk to them later on in the show, but first I want to hear from you. What's going on in your community? How have you been impacted? by the crisis. We want to hear from you in the stream and thank you for joining us on the show today. We want to incorporate your comments, your questions. What do you want to know from Jason and Shelly? Let us know in the stream and hopefully we'll get your questions and your comments heard on today's show. Before I bring on Jason and Shelly from McKinsey, we're going to take a deeper look at the McKinsey data in Working Together. It's LinkedIn's weekly series on the changing face of U.S. business. Report after report, data is showing Black Americans are disproportionately hit when the country faces a crisis. In the age of the coronavirus, those inequalities couldn't be more apparent. 39% of all jobs held by Black Americans are threatened by cuts amid COVID-19, according to a new report by McKinsey. That's about 7 million jobs where workers are likely to be laid off, furloughed, or lose part of their income. Small business owners and their staff are also disproportionately hit. That's because 45% of all Black-owned businesses are in sectors like leisure, hospitality, and retail. Those are the sectors that are hardest hit around the world and the sectors in which workers doubt they'll be able to financially recuperate in the near future. That's mostly for two main reasons. Black Americans have historically earned less than their white counterparts and are less likely to have an emergency fund. And while there are programs meant to help, the implementation of them is shaky, to say the least. It was just 13 days that we got through $349 billion. Under the CARES Act, people can now withdraw money from their 401k accounts, but it may not be that easy to do. This is absolutely ludicrous for this to be happening. She was put on hold for the day, the entire day. Meanwhile, there's a group of workers who do get to keep their jobs. Grocers, drivers, healthcare workers, newly deemed heroes who keep being asked to come to the front lines, even though they're more likely to be uninsured and have no paid sick leave. Women of color are more likely to be doing essential jobs than anyone else. There are more than 7.3 million Black workers in the United States who do not earn a paid sick day. And when workers have to choose between making money or not, they're one and a half times more likely to go to work sick. The White House is trying to step in and companies are feeling the pressure to provide benefits to workers, but that still leaves millions without sick leave. And amid the COVID-19 pandemic, it becomes even more dangerous for Black Americans, which are at higher risk to contract the virus because of underlying health conditions and because they live in higher density places with limited access to health care. It's clear that African Americans in particular are dying at a rate that is much higher than their populations. At the end, Black Americans will be disproportionately affected by the pandemic's fallout and likely to suffer with bankruptcies, evictions, and more. But researchers say that there are things our community and our government can do, like open up lending programs to those with low or no credit, expand benefits for hourly and gig workers, and focus on private and public partnerships. All right, there's a lot to unpack there, and I'm glad that we have Jason, Jason and Shelley from McKinsey with us on today's show to do just that. So Jason and Shelley, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Glad to be here. All right, so we just saw an overview of the report that McKinsey put together, but I want to start kind of where the research discovered in terms of where Black Americans live and where the pandemic is being spread. Yeah, well, the, the lens on location built on our previous work, um, identifying the impact of the racial wealth gap on the U.S. economy, um, which Shelly and I put together with the team about a year ago. And when you look at that data, you see that there are certain counties in the U.S. that Black people are disproportionately living in and working in. Um, 
that don't have the same setup for economic success. Well, those same factors, that same lens, we applied to COVID and we saw that there were sort of five underlying things in these different counties uh, that really set black people up to either be more susceptible to the disease from a health standpoint and more susceptible to the outcomes of the disease from an economic standpoint. And those things you mentioned in, in, the, in the montage that led up to this, it's access to health care, it's um, comorbidity rates, it is density of housing, concentrated poverty and other factors. So when we took that score and we looked at it um, in a rigorous and analytic way, what we found is that in the worst impacted counties in the US, about 10% of all Americans live in those counties, but almost 20% of black Americans live in those counties. Uh, and black Americans are just you know, around 11% of the overall population. So we are disproportionately represented in that group. Um, and so it sets us up from uh, the starting point to really focus on these areas and the, the, def the disinvestment and in infrastructure and other capabilities that start at a lower starting point. I mean, there's more ground to gain. Right. And you point on this a little bit, but it's not just a matter of where you live. It's access to testing, which is an acute problem that the black community is facing. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, I'm happy to. And I think you know, J Jason said it said it well. I mean, it starts with the with the places where we're more likely to live. But when you go and then you look inside those places, you ask yourself, what would the outcomes be for Black Americans in those places relative to the rest of the population? And what do we know? Uh, we know that uh, due to the, the the disproportionate amount of Black workers that are working on the front line, so to speak, right? You know, things like you know working in nursing. Uh, you know, 30 percent of those jobs are held by black Americans. Again, we're 12 percent of the population. So these high contact, high risk professions, you know, certainly suggest that the infection rate you know, could potentially be higher. So it starts with that. But the second thing is you know, also about testing, which links a little bit to uh, this place based analysis. You know, when we just looked at the numbers, you know, we found that, you know, 10 of the you know, you know, states where black folks are very highly populated, you know, higher than their normal amount, you know, we find that there's significantly less testing than we're seeing on average, right? And then, so if you think about it as infection rate being higher, testing rate being lower, and then the third piece, which Jason mentioned, is this notion of comorbidities um, and just the, the, the fragility of the underlying health infrastructure, you know, in Black America, significantly higher rate of comorbidities, which suggests potentially worse infections and, and unfortunately higher death rates, which we're seeing play out in the numbers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it kind of starts at the place, then it goes to higher infection, lower testing, and then worse outcomes. So these are all things that we wanted to bring, you know, to, to the front of the discussion. And you mentioned that Black Americans are higher likelihood of being in these frontline jobs that are risking their lives to go to work right now. But that's really only one side of the equation. We're also seeing that Black Americans are also more likely to be facing layoffs right now, as well as job reductions. And those two problems are coming together to create an even larger problem. Let's start with the, the layoffs and the job reductions. Why is the Black community being more acutely felt by these problems right now? Yeah. So, so look, I think you, you, you mentioned it, right? It's a bit of an ironic situation. On the one hand, you've got a disproportionate amount of frontline workers who are, are doing the things that America needs to continue to move forward in the context of this crisis, which means potentially higher infection rates. But then we also find on the other side, you know, that, you know, 40% uh, of the jobs held by Black Americans are, you know, are at risk of and, and have been seriously disrupted. You think about uh, you know, a lot of the folks that are working in hospitality and, and in retail, uh, you know, I, I, while some essential retail is still you know, operational, again, back to this notion of frontline workers, and, and, uh, many of these you know, restaurants and things like that, wait staff, those jobs are no longer uh, operational in many places. And so you, know, you get hit on the other side of this where you expect 7 million jobs, as it said in, in the video up front, to be at risk for Black Americans. And it links to something else that, that you saw uh, in that video from, from Pew, which is uh, that, that notion of being laid off hits Black America particularly hard due to uh, limited you know, savings and, and limited you know, liquidity uh, and, and, and very little ability to weather uh, any sort of shock like this from an employment perspective. Mm -hmm. 
For those of you who are just joining the stream, this is Business Unusual, a live show where we're talking with you about how the coronavirus is impacting the ways that we all work. We are talking with McKinsey Partners, Shelly Stewart, as well as Jason Wright about a new report out that's showing how the coronavirus is impacting the Black community. I want to say hello to Lakeisha from Houston, Raquel and Tammy from Atlanta, Mark from St. Louis, Garrett from Florida. Thank you so much for joining us. So we were just talking about the layoffs and the reductions. Let's now switch gears and talk a little bit more about the essential workers and the issues that they're facing right now, having to choose between, say, a paycheck and their health. And you mentioned the emergency funds, and there's only about 27% of Black Americans who have access to an emergency fund. So what does this really mean for that cohort of workers who has to make that decision right now? Yeah, I mean, the, the folks who are essential workers and on the front line are disproportionately Black and Brown. Latinx, uh, the Latinx workforce is very heavily represented in that same population. And it's the classic rock in a hard place, right? Like bills need to get paid. Uh, you have to continue to bring in an income. And especially if the rest of the folks in your household who might've worked in a more corporate job or something that's non-essential are at a higher risk of losing their job due to you know, uh, you know, rapid acceleration of automation programs or things that disproportionately affect black workers um, in the corporate sphere. So you feel this additional pressure to bring in income to weather the financial storm. Uh, so it is truly a rock and a hard place um, and a courageous decision, not just on financial matters, but from a mission orientation of actually caring about the people that you're going in to care for. So it's a commendable thing, but it's not exactly fair. <laughs> and if you take a step back and you look across the landscape, it's just a troubling picture uh, to see a disproportionate number of black and brown people doing work that puts them at disproportionate risk. But there are things that companies can and are doing to ensure that that risk is compensated for. You know, one example is, you know, most companies pay some sort of hazard pay or provide some sort of hazard pay to workers to represent the elevated risk that they're facing currently in the context of COVID. Um, and what some of the best and smartest human capital leaders are doing in the marketplace are saying, well, we should have a socioeconomic lens on that. Uh, that says hazard pay doesn't have to be a one size fits all. There can be a differential proportion of their base salary or their base compensation given if they are in a lower socioeconomic bracket, which we know is correlated with race um, and ethnicity. And so there are creative ways uh, to start to try to um, bridge the gap, but I don't think we'll ever feel good about it. It's just the nature of the right and I want to get to some of those solutions later on in the show as well. But going through the report, one of the most troubling parts of the report that I found was how Black women are disproportionately being impacted by this. Can you tell everyone on the stream a little bit about why this problem is acutely felt by Black women who are on the front lines? Sure. Um, black women, uh, in, in, uh, that ties back to a report that we did a while ago on the future of work and automation and what that means for Black America. But black women from an employment standpoint are actually very well positioned. I like to say this and my wife cheers this one is like carrying, just continuing to carry the load for black America economically um, and tying and tying uh, you know, the, the economic unit together. Um, but it's because of disproportionate representation in healthcare, nurses aides, psychological aids, um, elderly care, home health care. Black women are not only um, a, a large part of the workforce but are also leaders and business owners in that space. And so as a result, those are the folks who are most needed right now. Um, and so you see a lot of black women in the marketplace. The other place where black women are very highly represented is in retail. Um, my my 26 year old daughter has done retail uh, her entire career. Um, and until very recently, she was still going to work. Right. And so uh, th there's a disproportionate representation there because of the places where black women are located in the economy. And so while it is a benefit in the long run, because healthcare is not going away, it's growing in the future, and that is wonderful for the economic prospects of Black women going forward, it is a, a real challenge right now because of what COVID represents um, as a threat to them, not economically in this sense, but in a, in a very real uh, uh, personal life way. And a particular challenge given the high percentage of Black women that are, that are in charge of single parent households right now are right. school closures. Uh, which I thought was an interesting finding in the report and something that we've been discussing a lot here on Business Unusual and other shows on LinkedIn. Uh, is there a gig economy angle to this? How are Black workers being impacted who are in the gig economy right now? You know, we didn't dive deep into this, but um, we know already um, that Black and Brown workers, as well as immigrants of all backgrounds, are more, more represented in the gig economy. 
whether that's delivery services to transportation services and everything in between, even TaskRabbit and you know you know the the uh, TaskRabbit type services where it's, you know odds and ends and you know uh, secretarial work and things like that. So there's disproportionate representation there, but it is uh, it is a fallback. It's not a um, it's not a first option, right? Um, for many uh, workers of color, it is because they have not been able to find gainful employment or a living wage in the traditional marketplace, where there are the health and benefits, the health benefits and other benefits that are actually really important at this juncture. Um, uh, and so it, it feels like it, it is good, and it's good that it's there and as an option for people but it is a fallback that isn't going to give the type of momentum needed to give people a viable economic future coming out the other side, unless there are changes made in the space, those wages rise, and, and there's a, a better distribution of benefits that are more comparable to what folks can find in other careers. Another issue to this pandemic that I hadn't thought of was just the high percentage of black owned businesses that are in industries right now that are being hard hit by the crisis. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I mean, you know, you, you hit the nail on the, on the head in terms of the, the, the some of the different sectors, right? I mean, we're, we're at a point now where we don't know when, you know, some of these things that involve, you know, leisure activities, retail, hospitality will come back. We're still all trying to get our arms around when it will come back and what that will look like. And what do we know? We know that 40% of Black-owned businesses are actually in these highly disrupted sectors versus 25% of all businesses. So that creates quite a structural challenge up front. If you kind of think about, you know, the path forward, uh, you know, there, there's certainly stimulus money that is coming out and we've seen, and you featured some of this, uh, and obviously the money's been, been uh, this is the second round, and it's coming out quickly. We are seeing that some of the smaller businesses, and by the way, black businesses skew smaller on average, are having a, a more difficult time accessing these funds. And so, you know, while there is help out there, you know, there's some concern that it won't reach black businesses again because of this skew towards being a bit smaller. And so, you know, we've seen we've seen in prior downturns uh, and just even in normal times that the capitalization tends to be uh, a bit more of a challenge in black owned businesses. You know, it, you know the, the, the Fed had some data on the fact that black owned businesses tend to get um, you know, half of the needed capital that they think they need to scale the business um, with respect to what uh, non-Black owned businesses get. So you've got this uh, sector structural challenge at the outset, uh, which is uh, a bit murky with respect to, to, to when it will kind of, that picture will, will um, turn upright. And then you've got this funding challenge, notwithstanding the fact that there are stimulus dollars out there that links to some general challenges that Black owned businesses have had, even in normal times accessing funds. Funds and then uh, obviously in this greater heightened environment, it, 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 you one would expect it to be even more challenging. Well, Shelly, I'm seeing your concern being echoed in the stream right now. We have Nicole saying we are going to have to choose between making money and saving our families. Shelly says I'm in Las Vegas. 25% of workers have already lost their jobs. Minorities are hardest hit because of our huge service community. And Philip says thank you for stating the amount of African American nurses working in healthcare on the front lines. And I'm seeing that some questions. One from Shari asking for us to switch gears and talk about solutions. I think that we we've, we've seen historically that the Black community is hard hit during crisis crises, what can, what are, you know, what are the best employers doing right now to face this reality and try and make up for it in real time? Yeah, I, I can jump in there. Um, you know, Shelly and I are both, you know, we're not, you know, full-time researchers. We're also business leaders and advisors to some of the most influential businesses in the world. And, um, you know, while businesses are not social enterprises, nor should they be, the great talent leaders or the, the companies in the marketplace that have always had a great lens on talent are doing some really creative things here. And it's actually no different than the normal things they would do of thinking of taking care of their employees, creating great organizational health and culture, being thoughtful about layoffs, strategic about layoffs and the size of the workforce. But now they are doing it with what I would call an equity lens. And so I mentioned one of them already on hazard pay. Many companies and governments as well are, um, you know, state and local governments are looking at the use of hazard pay to, to compensate for the risk, but they're taking an equity lens to it. Um, that, that means that people who need it most are gonna get it. Another one is you know, a lot of companies are downsizing right now, and it's not a wrong thing for companies to be accelerating pilots and automation and things like that because they have to, they have to survive too. That said, when they are thinking about who is 
um, who is being uh, reduced during these reduction in force efforts, there should at least be data that the senior leadership engages on who is being let go. Um, and if you assume good intent, you're gonna start to see that the disproportionate number of people who are being let go are people of color and nobody feels good about that. And it makes you pause and reassess the strategy, understand where strategically you might wanna um, um, make those reductions or reinvestments in a different way if you actually just encounter and see that data. And then on the positive side, this is a moment where people, who, especially people who are working remote, might be able to only do 50% or 60% of their jobs, but they're going to stay employed. There is the capacity to start to do things that we've known would be a solution for companies going forward to modernize and move into you know, more digital analytic capabilities, as well as a real boon for the workforce of color, and that's reskilling initiatives. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect moment for companies to really invest in what they've wanted to do for a long time, and that's bring more digital analytic capabilities to the support workforce in a particular company. There's time on the schedule and time on the calendar to be able to do this, so that you emerge on the other side with a more diverse workforce that is even more well-equipped to do the work of the future. And so you can sort of hit two birds with one stone, keep people occupied, be investing in the future, and ensure that uh, you know the future workforce looks the way you want it to work with the company. Those are a few things that folks are doing. It is, and I'm really glad that you brought up that important point of company leaders making sure to track the racial composite of the workers that they are letting go, because as we all know, what, what gets tracked gets measured. So hopefully uh, the company's best, best leaders I've been speaking to are doing that. And so I'm glad that you brought that up. Shelly, from a policy standpoint, what are we seeing um, you know, from our policy leaders in terms of things that could really impact this issue right now? Yeah. Look, I think one thing that the American people seem to be in, in, in in violent agreement on is the need to surge resources, both on the lives and livelihood side to communities across this country. Uh, and what I would say is, you know, back to Jason's point around the private sector and tracking, the most critical thing is understanding where those resources are going and ensuring that those resources are going to communities that are hit the hardest. And so whether that's on the testing front and the and, you know, healthcare infrastructure, how do we ensure that uh, you know communities that are going to be at hardest, not just Black communities, but in general, you know, you know, lower income communities are getting access, equal access to testing, or even greater than equal access to testing because they're at greater risk. Uh, and so I just think that kind of seeing that all the way through, it's not sufficient to just say we're doing it and we're doing it in these places, but really tracking and understanding who is getting the testing and who's not. And similarly, on the on the uh, livelihood side. Uh, you know, back to this notion of, of supporting businesses, you know, how do we think about ensuring that and tracking in real time that these stimulus efforts and these, and these, fund, and the, and this, and these funds are going to businesses that are going to benefit from it the most because they've been hit the hardest. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, the coordinated response to surge resources, uh, I think, is the right answer. And, and what we've been encouraging people to do is to make sure that we're taking that lens of, are the people who need it most getting it? Because the issue that you have in many of these communities is if, you know, for example, Black Americans are not participating in the stimulus and the recovery, they will most certainly recover more slowly, which will have knock-on effects for consumption in these various, uh, you know, states and counties. And so it, it just it just underscores the importance of doing it in real time because if it ends up being a forensic accounting you know, three months, six months now, uh, then we'll have missed the opportunity because the funds will be gone. Right. So we've talked a little bit about the employer angle to this as well as the policy angle, but there's a community angle to this as well. I've seen some questions and comments in the stream. You know, for those who are joining us right now and want to know what they can do right now with their own paychecks to support the Black community, what would you say to them? Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, and I, I can take it from the, from the business angle. I think, it, you know, it, it's not... You know, there's no kind of you know silver bullet, so to speak, here. But I think it is about uh, you know supporting your local businesses, right? If you're living in a neighborhood where there are a lot of Black-owned businesses, uh, you know, there's just the financial support of going in and you know to the extent that it's safe and available, or to doing takeout, actually supporting those businesses. We've seen stories in the news of this. You know, there was uh, Mel was uh, up in Harlem where uh, they were on 60 Minutes and uh, they were talking about some of the challenges they're facing, and they got a surge of orders that were being sent to hospitals. And I mean, that's a bigger scale, but, but going in and supporting those businesses is one thing. I think another thing is, you know, likely if you're 
watching the stream now, you are someone who is out in the information stream and in the information flow. Share the information that you're learning. Not everyone is aware of all the programs and offerings. And so, you know, how do you think about, um, you know, using the knowledge and information that you have to help enable others who may be kind of more focused on just the day-to-day -day survival of their business? And then certainly, you know, if you're in certain sectors, there's, there's more direct opportunity. If you're in the financial services sector, you know, how are you influencing your colleagues to ensure that, you know, black owned businesses, again, in this, in this example are, you know, recipients and, and beneficiaries of some of the, some of the help that, that, that's basically being surged into the economy uh, where they, where, where these black businesses certainly need it. Right. And I've definitely seen some questions in the stream that I want to get to before we wrap. But before we do, there was a figure in the report that struck out to me, which is this $1.5 trillion that the economy could benefit for. If, say, something optimistic coming out of this pandemic, we build more equitable systems. Can you talk to us a little bit about what the opportunity is there for the economy if we use this pandemic as an opportunity to make our systems more equitable for the Black community? Sure. I'll, I'll speak to that number and where that came from. And then also to you know one example of an idea that's a bigger idea that can sort of build the kind of momentum that, that, that we find inspiring that can come out the other side of this. So uh, the number in the report is $1.5 trillion annually in, of, of GDP. That's 6% that's of GDP. That's uh, an, a boost to the economy that's larger than both of the last major economic expansions. And that comes from a previous report we wrote that said, uh, black wealth today on average for a family is around $17,000. The average white family's median wealth is $171,000, about a 10x gap. If you were able to close that gap through all the various things that we've talked about over the years, uh, it represents that much of a boost to the economy. Now, in the context of COVID, it's a bit more of the negative lens. So that was the rallying cry, right? There's a reason to focus on this, that it's not just about money in black folks' pockets. It's about the overall health of the economy um, and expansion for all of us. It's money in everybody's pockets. Uh, that said, the lens on COVID is a bit more negative. It says we are going to need momentum to come out of this as a U.S. economy. This is this is a, a very unique scenario that we are facing. Uh, that's why the markets are so unpredictable. Nobody knows what is going to happen. We do know that the, the impact is very negative and very sharp. And out the back end of this, every sector of the economy is going to need as much momentum as it can get. And if the racial wealth gap widens during this period, which it is set to do without intervention, that is going to be a ball and chain that drags on the economy going forward. And so it's worth not only doing the things that Shelley talked about and that you teed up, Carolyn, and that's what can individuals do to support by lending their time, their talent, and their influence, but also to look across sectors and figure out what are some of the big things that can happen. And one of the big ideas that we've talked a lot about is what can the private sector the public sector and the social sector do to make broadband ac access more democratized around communities of color, because it affects multiple nodes of what we talked about. It, ta it affects the black workers who are at home, um, who are unable to do as much work within corporate and have a higher represented, uh, a higher likelihood of reduced hours or uh, unpaid administrative leave because they can only do 60% of their job because they don't have reliable broadband access or the right technology at home. Um, it affects K-12 education and higher education, where there's a notable racial wealth achievement gap um, historically, uh, and that and that needs to be made up. And this this period, because people don't have the right technology at home or access to broadband, can widen those gaps as well. Um, and then it affects individual lives because telemedicine is the way that we are doing healthcare right now in the era of COVID, both to identify. COVID symptoms, but also just to take care of all the underlying factors and to stay healthy as a community. And so if there is a way for private sector company, te telecommunications companies to find a way to make a margin on this, doesn't have to be a big margin, but a margin. So it's net positive profit with um, the support of government and then social sector institutions who have trust in communities of color to get this access democratized. There can be some real great things. And um, I think there's people who are trying to lead in this space. And so there are big ideas like that that will help the economy achieve those aims on the back end of this. Yeah, so really appreciate that overview, Jason. And I want to get to some questions that we have from members in the stream right now. Chad is asking for a comparison of this to the last economic downturn, specifically about transferring of wealth like we saw in 08. Did you make any comparisons in the report to what's happening now versus what we have during the last financial crisis? Look, I, we we didn't we didn't quantify 
specifically, but what I will say is we are quite concerned that directionally you will see the same thing occur. Uh, and, and for many of the reasons that we just that we just flagged. Uh, and we know that traditionally after recessions, you know, black Americans uh, tend to stay unemployed for longer. They tend to suffer from higher foreclosure rates. They, they, the, the housing values in the neighborhoods they live in tend to grow at a slower growth rate coming out of, of, of these recessions. And so uh, I think there are some, some stark differences here that unfortunately actually could make it worse in, 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 in this particular crisis, in, in, in my opinion. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with, again, this notion of 40% of black businesses are in these sectors that are where there's just a big question mark in terms of the uh, rate of acceleration back to normal and what even the new normal will look like. So I, I think as, as Jason said, we are trying to use this uh, crisis, uh, which we didn't want to have to do, but as a catalyst to address the long-term structural challenges that Black Americans face uh, in, in the hopes that we can prevent these disproportionate uh, impacts in the future when, when these exogenous events happen. Right. Well, I know I speak for everyone in the stream when I say, Shelly and Jason, this has been a great conversation. I've learned a lot. I can tell from Rebecca, Jody, Cynthia, Bill, Billy from Denver that they are learning a lot as well. And we appreciate your leadership on this issue and for taking time to talk with us on today's show. Absolutely. Thank you yeah. for having us. Yeah, yeah thanks. That was Shelly Stewart and Jason Wright from McKinsey talking about a new report that they have out on how the coronavirus is impacting the black community acutely. I wanna thank them for coming on today's show. This is Business Unusual, a live show where we're talking with you about how the coronavirus is impacting the ways that we all work. We come to you live every weekday at noon. My colleague Susie Jackson will be back tomorrow with a panel of teachers talking specifically about how teachers are being impacted by this crisis and teaching all of our school children as the country continues to face a shutdown. So be sure and tune in for that. I'm Caroline Fairchild. Thank you so much for joining us.